everybody. My name is Michael DeJoya, and welcome to the Dash Trader Newsroom. Today, we're going to be talking about Fitch Rating Agency lowers the U.S. credit uh, rating to double A plus from triple A. Um, what are the short and long term ramifications to this? And uh, my name is Michael DeJoya, Director of Educational Services here at Dash Trader, joined today by Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Jill, how are you? Doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's good to see you uh, on the uh, on the Nasdaq desk. There mm -hmm. um, was there uh, not too long ago doing one of our events, and uh, we'll be back uh, be back there soon. Um, so tell me about the uh, Fitch Credit Rating Agency and what the long and short term effects will be. Uh, is there any chance that they will revise this um, in the near future? Um, what are the details? Let's do a deep dive into this credit rating change because yesterday was quite a turbulent uh, day in the markets. Yeah, you know, will anything switch around in the near term? Probably not. I mean, the last time that there was a downgrade on U.S. debt by S&P was in 2011 when they took it from a triple A to a double A plus. Um, and, you know, the, the reasons somewhat remain the same. Clearly, there's an issue with governance and um, fiscal policy. I, I think what's interesting about it is that we're really one of the only developed nations in the world that talks openly about default. So it, it's not like this is something new, of course, I and mean, the, the headlines are a bit shocking. Um, but you have to remember, it, it's almost like downgrading your credit worthiness from extremely good to very good. I, I think the bigger implications are the reasons why um, and, and what's underneath the surface. I mean, clearly the U.S. is still highly credit worthy. Um, it's not like people are going to just pull all of their money out of our bonds and, and you know, de-dollarize their balance sheets. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, the biggest concern is why I don't think that it's going to be a near-term thing is that the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years and you know we have a high and a growing general government debt burden that really lends to why Fitch you know used the citation of erosion of governance you know relative to the double a plus to triple a so I mean, I think that's basically what Fitch said is that the the uh the repeated debt ceiling argument which we have a little uh, graphic here showing the debt ceiling and then a big breakout each and every time there's a debt ceiling argument and then we break out and go higher. It's kind of like a, a a really bullish chart for debt, which is not a good thing for the economy overall. But the uh, on top of that, there is also that they said that they see a, a significant economic decline in the next three years or erosion of the economic situation in the country. I mean, that is kind of... Um, very similar, I think. I think it was Jamie Dimon was also saying some similar things, um, you know, in a meeting uh, that was kind of uh, widely talked about yesterday. Right. But, uh, they they, we're they, they didn't say over that, and over that there's kind of a, a very poor economic outlook over the next three years. Well, I think I would make that distinction. The expectation over the next three years fiscal deterioration, which is different than the economy. U.S. debt may be bad, but the U.S. economy itself is doing well. So that's an important distinction that you want to make. Um, Absolutely. You know, it, 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 the, the rating is essentially is an expression of probability of default, but the risk of a U.S. default is still very low. So, you know, a, a number of analysts have come out saying that the downgrade, they don't expect it to have a lasting impact on the market um, as much as the headlines may suggest. But I think, you know, part of the challenge is, is that the you kind of have this counterbalance where you have fiscal expansion, whereas we're trying to tighten monetary policy. So there's there's two very extreme forces counterbalancing each other. Got it. Got it. So let, let's do a deep dive um, into what are some of the effects. And, and one of the one of the things that I see was that the treasuries really spiked um, as of uh, as of yesterday. So there was a, a drastic increase in some of the, it seemed to be more like the long-term rates, um, but also uh, the chart here of the 10-year um, seemed to show that the treasuries uh, spiked, the treasury yields spiked. Um, does that have a negative effect on bank balance sheets? I mean, what what are the uh, effects of the change in, in the U.S. credit rating from Fitch? Is there, are there any? I other? think I would. I think I would. I would look at asset valuations more than anything else because you could see them come under significant pressure because the fixed income market could serve as an even stronger alternative for investors. And I also think it's worth noting that, well, you, you don't want to be too dismissive 
merits of, of Fitch's decision. You, you can't dismiss the underlying reasons for it. Um, you know, the fact is the U.S. debt situation is unsustainable because it, it's going to increasingly crowd out the country's ability to pay for what Americans need and want in the years ahead. And the whole point is, is to get fiscal policy under control. Um, and, you know, you have to think about the interest on debt, right? It's, since the U.S. spends more than it takes in through taxes and fees every year, it borrows to make up the difference so it can pay back all the bills, which we do without fail. But um, this is why the credit risk is increasing. It's almost like if you maxed out your, your credit card limits, $50,000, and you keep asking for credit increases and you're borrowing from another credit card to pay the original balance, in a simplistic way, that's essentially what's happening. And that's why the credit risk is increasing. Yes, and, and it's certainly reducing the government's ability to pay for things because it's paying a larger percentage of its overall budget to pay down, to pay current debt, not even to pay down debt. It's just paying the interest, basically, which is not a good situation to be in. Um, we also saw that the Bank of Inter uh, the Bank of England increased its rates um, for the 14th consecutive rate hike, kind of keeping in line with the um, uh, with the uh, the Fed, which also increased rates recently. Uh, these are the highest interest rates since 2008. Um, you know, and I see right here our plan is uh, is working. Um, I'm not sure what the plan is. I mean, the plan is to keep raising interest rates to get inflation under control, from what I can tell. Um, but the situation in England is somewhat different than the United States. I mean, they've kind of gotten the perfect storm. What are your thoughts about the uh, the, the Bank of English, uh, Bank of England interest rate? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, while inflation may feel painful in the U.S., we are certainly not the only ones grappling with it. Um, you know, it persists in the EU. Certainly, the U.K. is um, one of the hardest hits when it comes to inflation. Um, somewhat to what we're seeing here, inflation is falling. That's the big, the good news, but. Um, again, and their target is 2% as well, just like ours with core. But the you know, fact of the matter is they're more than double away from that. Um, and I think that the messaging has been consistent, not only from our own Fed, but from global central banks that and until they are able to get inflation under control, it's going to be higher interest rates for longer. I think um, any potential of cuts certainly out for 2023. They haven't signaled that whatsoever. So yeah. I think you know, higher for longer is, is what it's going to be for the time being. Yeah, higher for long. I mean, that that's putting. I mean, I'm putting my own forecast into the seven percent range. I mean, uh, by by 2024, which is, uh, you know, it's obviously a significant change from just a few years ago. So, anyway, let's uh, let's hope uh, there's no, um, you know, uh, collateral damage from these high interest rates, and that certainly does affect bank balance sheets for sure. Um, going into earnings season, what were the overall trends for earnings season? Uh, did you notice anything in specific thus far in earnings season? We've had a couple of the big uh, technology companies come out. Um, how have earnings been overall? And what do you expect going forward into the third quarter for this year? Well, I think the general consensus is that companies are on their earnings recession. We see that sales are growing, but margin, margins have been squeezed. So that's why you're seeing uh, some lower earnings or profits. Um, and it, it's it's starting, but that's kind of starting to change, which is why they're calling an earnings recession is input prices fall. And we're also starting to see wage growth slow. So I, that's going to be obviously it's a key component when you look at net margins, because if input and wage growth slows, even though revenue is coming down, it will help alleviate some of the squeeze that they're seeing on margins. But I think it's also important to point out that not all sectors are, are necessarily um, falling, if you will. Leisure, hospitality, that includes airlines, hotels, cruise ships. We've seen what happened with the airlines and cruise stocks. They're still strong. Yeah. Um, but, you know, still a little bit of manufacturing slow down here. We're seeing the pressure in energy. We're seeing the pressure in materials. So I think really the, the translation that you'll see as it relates to inflation coming down, again, input and in, um, wage growth slowing is really going to be a key component of margin performance going forward. I, I don't think that guidance was especially strong or, or stood out significantly um, anywhere. I think, you know, especially with the tech companies and other companies that have been leveraging AI um, in their stories and in, in their stock prices, um, it might not necessarily have been reflected in Q2. So the market's going to be looking for, okay, how is this translating to new product, new sales, new verticals? Um, and I, I I feel like we just haven't heard enough about that um, yeah. in guidance so far. 
All right. So, I mean, what are you looking for the third quarter? I mean, are, are we looking for more of the same? Um, you know, it's just basically what, what do you think companies are going to be uh, – what, what are traders and investors going to be looking for for third quarter earnings? I think they're still going to continue to look for the same thing because you have to remember the bar was set pretty low well for this quarter. And yes. um, I, I think expectations were, I don't want to say blown out of the water, but um, the quick revisions had to be made just because of the run that we saw in, in different sectors and certainly specific stocks. So um, revisions have to be made there so that, you know, the, the multiples and the valuations are going to have to be justified at some point. Yeah. So while you might have somewhat got uh, in the past for this quarter, I think Q3 and Q4 are going to be particularly important. You have to remember we're coming into what's going to be an aggressive election cycle. Um, and, and again, you know, I, I think Fitch downgrade um, reflects some of those concerns. Um, and I think the, the general macro environment is going to be key for what we're hearing from corporates. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Jill. As insightful as always. And I, I mean, it was very, very interesting to hear that really Fitch was just catching up with S&P, which has downgraded us since 2011. I do vaguely remember that downgrade in 2011. And it's good to put it into perspective that we've gone from very good to just good. It's not really that like we, our credit rating is bad. It's just that it's just not as good as it was. And this is something that we've kind of known about for a while. So thanks so much, Jill. I want you to wish you a happy weekend and uh, see you next time. Thank you. All right. Take care, Mike. Thank you. Bye-bye now. All right. So um, here we are on our gas trader platform. We're going to just do a quick market analysis segment. Let's take a look at the S&P. So here we have the S&P. Uh, the SPY, which is the ETF for the um, for the entire S and P uh, one uh, S and P one hundred index. This is the broader based index. So if we want to look at the QQQ, which is just technology, we have a very bearish double top, top double top. Let me just draw in a trend line here. And uh, let's put the trend line in on my chart. I'm going to use a trend line ray. And the difference between a trend line and a trend line ray is that it extends forward. So you can see that it continues. So we have the top, double top, drop. And that drop was on the uh, Fitch rating change. On the SPY, we also have a top, double top, drop. Here's a top, top, double top. There's the trend line break. And then we faded back to our moving averages. This is the 10 and the 20 period moving average. And uh, we had a very, very nice trend line break and then fade to the upside today. But, you know, this is a very typical continuation pattern. Now on the Dow Jones, uh, we also have that same pattern, top, double top, drop. The markets overall are very, very low volume, except yesterday was a big time spike in volume related to that uh, downgrading by Fitch rating, um, rating agency. Now let's go to some of the big names like AAPL, Apple. Apple uh, making a big drop as well. You're gonna see this pretty much across the board, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft here at the bottom of the range, potentially rolling over. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of bearishness in a lot of the big companies like AMZN. Here's Amazon, uh, you know, really at the bottom of its range underneath its moving averages. So when price is above the moving average, it's considered bullish. And we've been in a bullish phase for pretty much three months. But now price has kind of reverted back under the moving averages. As long as price stays under the moving averages, we should consider that the market has gotten somewhat bearish. Um, COST, COST, here's Costco, um, kind of a big pullback, nice little bounce today, but um, but certainly a, a bit of bearishness. Um, you know, I was just talking to a friend of mine who told me he just closed his puts on, um, you know, it was kind of a, a counter trend reversal play on Costco. Um, but certainly that Fitch rating change, um, you know, helped it out as well. But um, yeah, we got Costco. Let's take a look at like Ford Motor Corporation, very much down off its highs. GM, these are kind of bigger old economy kind of stocks, industrial companies. 3M, all of these stocks are, are showing signs of pulling back. Now they have gotten a bit oversold. 
And when we get very oversold like this, um, you'd expect some kind of a bounce. But um, but certainly we have not seen that happen yet. Um, the next thing I want to take a look at is oil. This is the oil ETN. Now, the, an ETN is different than an ETF, but certainly it does reflect the overall price of oil. Now, I want to show you what you can do here when you go in your Dash Trader. You can go to your monthly, and then I'm going to hit OK. And here, I'm going to extend the data, data config, to go back a little bit further. I'm going to go back to... Let's just go to 2020 and I hit okay. And I'm gonna go back into my data config and put up a monthly chart. And I wanted to really point this out on oil. If you notice oil has put in a bullish reversal month on the monthly. Now oil is the prime commodity. The prime commodity pretty much leads inflation. So if oil starts to go up, inflation will go up. It'll cause inflation in the rest of the economy. Now, if you take a look at the S&P, it's almost the exact opposite picture. We are at prior highs, highs established in 2021. And now that's possibly showing like this rally is running out of steam. This would be a top potential double top in the market. We put it on the QQQ, top double top on the market. I mean, this does not bode well for the economy overall when you see this kind of profit taking near a prior high. Now, the rally might not be over yet. We're just starting August. It, you know, August is, is usually a month where you don't get really clear um, moves. You don't get very, very definitive moves in August. But for the time of year to be lining up, with September, where we might see a market reversal, September and October are generally statistically the most bearish times of the year. If you're going to get a market sell-off, it would usually happen in September and October, potentially into November. Usually you get some kind of a rally related to Christmas and the holiday season in December. So certainly that this time of year is, is shaping up for a potential bearish move in the market. It's still in a bullish uptrend. We are still in a bullish mode in the short term, but we are getting long-term setup that are potentially bearish. And that's important to take note of. And um, we're not just seeing this in oil and in, um, in, in the uh, actual indexes. We're also seeing it in things like gold. So if I go to gold and I bring up a monthly chart, you'll see that gold is certainly setting up um for a potential move up you have a low a higher low it's above prices above the moving averages so gold certainly is the um the uh the hedge from us dollar so if you're worried about the the devaluing of the us dollar you might put your money in gold um and there you go you see gold is also looking like it's it's probably getting ready to move higher as well um another one that we like to look at is gbtc um, although, I mean, Bitcoin is certainly uh, off its lows and uh, it's it's above its moving averages on its monthly. So um, Bitcoin as well, also looking somewhat healthy and ready for a move up. E ETHE is the uh, Ethereum. Now that chart is just kind of weird, but um, but certainly Ethereum does move in correlation with Bitcoin. So these are things that are all indicating that there there is some hedging going on and that the market might be... Um, Still short-term, tradably higher, but after September that there might be some dark cloud cover coming in the near future. Let's go back to the charts. Uh, let's go back to the slides and um, wrap things up as we just finished our market analysis section. Stay up to date with all things DAS by registering for our monthly newsletter and emails. Fill out for uh, at the bottom of our website at www.dashtrader.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at DAS Trader TV uh, for DAS Newsroom reminders. Uh, follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you so much, as always, for joining me here at the DAS Trader Newsroom. Look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Trade well, everybody.